11. Moment of Truth Le Chiffre looked in curiously at him, the whites of his eyes which showed all around the irises lending something impassive and doll-like to his gaze. He slowly removed one thick hand from the table and slipped it into the pocket of his dinner jacket. The hand came out holding a small metal cylinder with a cap which Le Chiffre unscrewed. He inserted the nozzle of the cylinder, with an obscene deliberation, twice into each black nostril in turn, and luxuriously inhaled the benzedrine vapor. Unhurriedly, he pocketed the inhaler, then his hand came quickly back above the level of the table and gave the shoe its usual hard, sharp slap. During this offensive pantomime, Bond had coldly held the banker's gaze, taking in the wide expanse of white face surmounted by the short, abrupt cliff of reddish-brown hair, the unsmiling, wet-red mouth, and the impressive width of the shoulders loosely draped in a massively cut dinner jacket. But for the highlights on the satin of the shawl-cut lapels, he might have been faced by the thick bust of a black-fleeced minotaur rising out of a green grass field. Bond slipped a packet of notes onto the table without counting them. If he lost, the croupier would extract what was necessary to cover the bet. But the easy gesture conveyed that Bond didn't expect to lose, and that this was only a token display from the deep funds at Bond's disposal. The other players sensed a tension between the two gamblers, and there was silence as the chef fingered the four cards out of the shoe. The croupier slipped Bond's two cards across to him with the tip of his spatula. Bond, still with his eyes holding the sheaths, reached his right hand out a few inches, glanced down very swiftly, then, as he looked up again impassively at the shift, with a disdainful gesture, he tossed the cards face upwards on the table. They were a four and a five. An unbeatable nine. There was a little gasp of envy from the table, and the players to the left of Bond exchanged rueful glances at their failure to accept the two million franc bet. With a hint of a shrug, Le Chiffre slowly faced his own two cards and flicked them away with his fingernail. They were two valueless knaves. Le Baccarat, intoned the croupier as he spaded the thick chips over the table to Bond. Bond slipped them into his right-hand pocket with the unused packet of notes. His face showed no emotion, but he was pleased with the success of his first coup, and with the outcome of the silent clash of wills across the table. The woman on his left, the American Mrs. Dupont, turned to him with a wry smile. I shouldn't have let it come to you, she said. Directly the cards were dealt, I kicked myself. It's only the beginning of the game, said Bond. You may be right the next time you pass it. Mr. Dupont leant forward from the other side of his wife. If one could be right every hand, none of us would be here, he said philosophically. I would be. His wife laughed. You don't think I do this for pleasure? As the game went on, Bond looked over the spectators leaning on the high brass rail around the table. He soon saw Le Chiffre's two gunmen. They stood behind and to either side of the banker. They looked respectable enough, but not sufficiently a part of the game to be unobtrusive. The one more or less behind Le Chiffre's right arm was tall and funereal in his dinner jacket. His face was wooden and grey, but his eyes flickered and gleamed like a conjurer's. His whole long body was restless, and his hands shifted off it on the brass rail. Bond guessed that he would kill without interest or concern for what he killed, and that he would prefer strangling. He had something of Lenny and of mice and men, but his inhumanity would not come from infantilism, but from drugs. Marijuana, decided Bond. The other man looked like a Corsican shopkeeper. He was short and very dark, with a flat head covered with thickly greased hair. He seemed to be a cripple. A chunky malacca cane with a rubber tip hung on the rail beside him. He must have had permission to bring the cane into the casino with him, reflected Bond, who knew that neither sticks nor any other objects were allowed in the rooms, as a precaution against acts of violence. He looked sleek and well-fed. His mouth hung vacantly half-open and revealed very bad teeth. He wore a heavy black moustache, and the backs of his hands on the rail were matted with black hair. Bond guessed that the hair covered most of his squat body. Naked, Bond supposed, he would be an obscene object. The game continued uneventfully, but with a slight bias against the bank. The third coup is the sound barrier at Chemin de Fer and Baccarat. Your luck can defeat the first and second tests, but when the third deal comes along, it most often spells disaster. Again and again at this point, you find yourself being bounced back to earth. It was like that now. Neither the bank nor any of the players seemed to be able to get hot. But there was a steady and inexorable seepage against the bank, amounting after two hours' play to ten million francs. Bond had no idea what profits the chief had made over the past two days. He estimated them at five million, and guessed that now the banker's capital could not be more than twenty million. In fact, the chief had lost heavily all that afternoon. At this moment, he only had ten million left. Bond, on the other hand, by one o'clock in the morning, had won four million, bringing his resources up to twenty-eight million. Bond was cautiously pleased. Le chief showed no trace of emotion. He continued to play like an automaton, never speaking except when he gave instructions in a low aside to the croupier at the opening of each new bank. Outside the pool of silence around the high table, there was a constant hum of the other tables, chemin de fer, roulette, and trente-quatre, interspersed with the clear calls of the croupier and occasionally bursts of lasper or grasps of excitement from different corners of the huge salle. In the background, there thudded always the hidden metronome of the casino, ticking up its little treasure of one percent with each spin of a wheel and each turn of a card, a pulsing fat cat with a zero for a heart. It was at ten minutes past one by Bond's watch when, at the high table, the whole pattern of play suddenly altered. The Greek at number one was still having a bad time. He lost the first coup of half a million francs and the second. He passed the third time, leaving a bank of two millions. Carmel Delane at number two refused it. So did Lady Danvers at number three. 
The Duponts looked at each other. Bonco, said Mrs. Dupont, and promptly lost to the banker's natural eight. Un bonco de quatre millions, said the croupier. Bonco, said Bond, pushing out a wad of notes. Again he fixed the sheaf with his eye. Again he gave only a cursory look at his two cards. No, he said. He held a marginal five. The position was dangerous. Le chief turned up a knave and a four. He gave the shoe another slap. He drew a three. C'est à la banque, said the croupier. A cinq, he added as he tipped Bond's losing cards face upwards. He raked over Bond's money, extracting four million francs and then returning the remainder to Bond. Un banque de huit millions. Souvi, said Bond, and lost again to a natural nine. In two coups, he had lost twelve million francs. By scraping the barrel, he had just 16 million francs left, exactly the amount of the next Bonco. Suddenly Bond felt the sweat on his palms. Like snow in the sunshine, his capital had melted. With the covetous deliberation of the winning gambler, Le Chiffre was tapping a light tattoo on the table with his right hand. Bond looked across into the eyes of Murky Basalt. They held an ironical question. Do you want the full treatment? They seemed to ask. Suvi, said Bond softly. He took some notes and plaques out of his right hand pocket and the entire stack of notes out of his left and pushed them forward. There was no hint in his movements that this would be his last stake. His mouth felt suddenly as dry as flock wallpaper. He looked up and saw Vesper and Felix Leiter standing where the gunman with the stick had stood. He did not know how long they had been standing there. Leiter looked faintly worried, but Vesper smiled encouragement at him. He heard a faint rattle on the rail behind him and turned his head. The battery of bad teeth under the black moustache gaped vacantly back at him. Le jeu est fait, said the croupier, and the two cards came slithering towards him over the green bays. A green baize which was no longer smooth, but thick now, and furry and almost choking, its color as livid as the grass on a fresh tomb. The light from the broad, satin-lined shades which had seemed so welcoming now seemed to take the color out of his hand as he glanced at the cards. Then he looked again. It was nearly as bad as it could have been. The king of hearts and an ace, the ace of spades. It squinted up at him like a black widow spider. A card. He still kept all emotion out of his voice. The chief faced his own two cards. He had a queen and a black five. He looked at Bond and pressed out another card with a wide forefinger. The table was absolutely silent. He faced it and flicked it away. The croupier lifted it delicately with his spatula and slipped it over to Bond. It was a good card, the five of hearts. But to Bond it was a difficult fingerprint in dried blood. He now had a count of six and the chief a count of five. But the banker, having a five and giving a five, would and must draw another card and try and improve with a one, two, three, or four. Drawing any other card, he would be defeated. The odds were on Bond's side. But now it was Le Chiffre who looked across into Bond's eyes and hardly glanced at the card as he flicked it upwards on the table. It was, unnecessarily, the best of four, giving the bank a count of nine. He had won, almost slowing up. Bond was beaten and cleaned out.